Hey, deserving listeners. So I sat down to watch the reunion of Love is Blind, and I learned that it doesn't air until tonight. So instead of me just sitting in this chair and staring at a blank screen, I thought I would watch some TikTok videos related to Love is Blind season six. And uh, some people have already been sending me some videos. I also thought I would search on TikTok for other videos, but a lot of people have been, or a few people have been sending me this video. So I thought I would watch it. And by the way, this episode will likely have a free portion, but the full video will be for members only. Because, you know, these videos where I'm watching TikTok are kind of like one-off videos. They're not like the main storyline. So I thought I would reward the members for supporting what I'm doing here. It is by a TikTok person named Ginger Snaps. So let's watch. The person that I am discussing in this, let's call them Schmear Me. Okay, so sounds like Jeremy. Let's continue watching. Soda, and that is when I stumbled across Schmeremy's store that he owned at the time. I go in, I find out he. Okay, so sounds like she went into Jeremy's supplement store that he owned. Interesting. He has all the supplements I need. I'm excited. I end up buying some stuff and I start making it my regular place. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if I included it. She was saying this was around 2013, 2014. I start coming in pretty regularly and, and then I start seeing him around the gym. And he goes, hey, would you ever be interested in running a booth for me and talking about the supplements, handing out samples at the, the gym? I said, sure, absolutely. I was looking to make a little extra money. I was bartending at the time, so I had tons of time during the day. And then I um, work then, you know, few weeks, few months pass, and he goes, hey, would you like to, you know, work part-time in the store? And I was like, sure. So the more time we ended up spending together, the more we ended up liking each other. Okay, so no huge red flags yet, although you could say that you have an owner slash manager who I think is about to date his employee, Absolutely, that can be a power play. It can create pressure on the employee to comply when they don't really want to, right, on a variety of levels, which employers and managers and bosses, superiors at work will use to their advantage or will exploit or will unknowingly cause pressure. You know, there's a lot of variety to it. So I guess that's notable. But just hearing that, you know, I have friends that have been married for almost 30 years and they met that way. So it's not automatically a problem. It all just depends on how the employee feels as things are progressing, right? If they feel like they have agency or the option to say no without retribution. It's really, and the more time we spent together, the more we liked each other and we started dating. Uh, I started staying at his house more and more. And my current living situation that I was in, I was renting from a friend whose house was going into foreclosure, and I knew this. Um, so she, I just knew that when the time came, I was going to have 30 days to get a, get out of Dodge, and I was going to have to quickly find somewhere to go. Okay, now, not always, but when it comes to people who have a tendency to love bomb, and listen to my deep dive on love bombing, it's a lot more complicated than typically the way people talk about it on the internet anyway. And... A brief summary of the definition is that you have someone that is racing through the initial steps of a relationship, like saying the, the love word or uh, racing to have sex sooner than later, racing to move in, racing to have kids, racing to get married, um, showering with a lot of affection and a lot of messages that uh, the love bomber is very, very, very in love with you, right? And uh, admires you, worships you, this kind of thing. And the key is that when it comes to true love bombing, it is inflexible and it is not in consideration of the target. Meaning that if the target says, hey, I want to slow down a little bit, the love bomber won't uh, accept that. They they don't really love the person. They don't really care about the person's feelings. It's more of what 
the object is giving them, right? And or they have a lot of desperation. And the main, in my anecdotal experience, cause of the love bombing is not a, a purposeful plan to manipulate. It is a product of their attachment insecurity that they are so desperate to cling. And then once the relationship progresses a little further down the road, the person, their attachment injuries and their vulnerabilities will be triggered and they will get very upset. So it'll look like if you're the target, it'll look very strange because there's all this love and love and you just feel like, oh, and that's the, the trick of it. It's just like, wow, this feels so good. I've never felt so secure. This person will never get angry at me. Look how much they love me. And then all of a sudden they turn, right? And from the look of it, and this is the way people often describe it, is that, oh, you never loved me. You were just manipulating me so you could abuse me. That does happen. I'll get to that in a second. But that's not the typical conceptualization that I come to with these sort of people. In the beginning, they did love. They didn't respect the boundaries at times. But sometimes the object will go along with the love bombing because it feels so good. It, it, it can be intoxicating. I mean, that amount of love, and it, it's real. And it, the way I would define love, it's, it's real love. It's not balanced love. It's not truly in consideration of the other person's entirety of their feelings, but it, it is genuine affection. But they have all these vulnerabilities, and when they're triggered, they become very, very upset, angry, rejecting, whatever. It seems to turn on, turn on a dime. And then they uh, turn back. You know, it's sort of a flip-flopping between those two. So that's the m most common version of love bombing that I see uh, clinically. There's a smaller group, which is the nefarious, perhaps psychopathic sort of love bombing, where the person in a perhaps Machiavellian manner will plan in advance to manipulate. They don't love the object at all. <laughs> they are making it up. They might like the object. They might you know, have some affection for the victim, but they are not genuine. Most of what they're doing is a trick to manipulate, to pull someone in. And love bombing can happen in romantic relationships, but it could also happen at work. You can have a recruiter uh, reach out to you or a boss that's trying to manipulate or a boss that has attachment injuries. You can have a cult or a religious group, a, hi a high control group that will love bomb and you just feel so good. You're like, oh, look at all these friends. Cults often have a, an element of that. And as with romantic relationships, those high control groups can be planning that out. They know how to manipulate so that they can get more members or they genuinely believe in their shtick and they genuinely love this new member and they just want to spread love around. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of variation here. People tend to talk about it like it's always nefarious, but it, it simply is not. Research doesn't demonstrate that. So when it comes to love bombing, one can be easily victimized at certain vulnerable moments, like you don't have a place to live, or you just lost your job and you don't have any money, or you're lonely, or you just got out of a cult, <laughs> or you're looking for meaning and a cult comes along, or you are you don't believe that you'll ever find somebody, you know? So there, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that can set someone up for love bombing to occur. I don't know if that's what, what's gonna happen here, but let's keep an eye on it. So at the time, I, of course, timely, timely, the notice comes through that the foreclosure is gonna be happening and I have to be out in 30 days. At this point, we hadn't been dating for very long, so we were kind of on the fence of, do I get my own place and sign a lease somewhere or do I move in with you? And ultimately, uh, we decided to move in. I move in with him. Okay, so it doesn't sound like love bombing. It just sounds like a mutual decision. Every th the, the way she's framing everything, it sounds like mutual decisions. The way she framed the two of them liking each other as working together. My dogs are barking. That's the way she was framing it. She didn't say that he sucked her in or anything. And then the way she framed moving in, the way she framed it is she introduced that that idea. Now, some manipulative people will have ways of making it feel like it's your idea, but we're not hearing anything like that. So everything sounds, there's, there's no red flags yet. 
So first few months, great. You know, getting used to somebody, you're still in that like honeymoon phase, right? So the first few months are really good. And then the bickering started. So the worst, the first fight that was probably the worst was when my brother came to visit. Um, so again, I'm having some problems with TikTok guys, so I'm gonna stop it here and- Okay, so they have a fight again. Nothing strange there. People will have fights, unfortunately. So they came down when I was living with Shmirmi, and one night we decided to go out to a karaoke bar. So I had been to this bar quite a few times, and I know quite a few of the patrons there. So we get in there, and I go to the bar to get us some drinks, and I'm there for a while waiting for the drinks. They're pretty busy in there, always. <laughs> so I go in and I get the drinks and I'm waiting at the bar and I'm just chit chatting with the guy next to me. Um, one of the other patrons that's there pretty regularly. Since she's telling this story and she has talked about trigger warnings about domestic violence, I'm terrified of what she's going to say here. And she's saying that she goes out with Jeremy. She says, Shmeremy. We don't know if that's Jeremy. We're hearing that she goes to the bar to get a drink and she's just chatting with a guy there randomly and i'm guessing that jeremy gets jealous and upset uh Shmirmi comes up and he's visibly upset and it, he's upset that i'm talking to this guy for so long and in my mind i'm thinking i'm just being friendly i know this person but it, he was upset about this all right so when I hear that, I don't know. I don't know if any of this is true. I don't even know if it's about Jeremy. But when I hear that, that says something, right? When she emphasizes that, she's like, he was upset, y'all. It's hard to put into behavioral markers when we as humans observe, not always accurately, but when we are observing someone who is having a fight or flight reaction, a lot of adrenaline, and is really worked up. There are behavioral markers in their tone of voice, the loudness of their voice, or the pressure of their words, clenching one's fists, or the way their face looks. There's certain facial expressions involved, not always, right? Certainly you can have someone that is raging, and if you didn't know them well enough, you would think that they were super calm. That, that can happen too. But we're hearing that. And when I hear that, I would suspect that he wasn't just angry because he wanted to be angry. He had a, a visceral a reaction. And why would someone have that reaction? Well, typically with this kind of jealousy and this kind of anger, I find when I treat clients that it comes from a place of panic. It comes from a place of attachment insecurity where they observe a fact, which is his attachment figure, the person that he loves and wants to be with, someone that he w doesn't want to leave him, uh, her, Ginger Snaps on TikTok, and is seeing her talk to another man. That's a fact that's happening. It's interpreted, right, as, wait, what is happening? It, it, does she want to be with it? You know, when it comes to attachment and security, we will take massive leaps, right? That if, if we just say it out loud, it's so silly, right? That, well, she's talking to a man, which means that she wants to be with that man or she's going to be with that man, even though she knows I'm back here. And even though she has no track record of cheating, presumably, and no track record of being that the kind of person that would just uh, be a flake and just run off with someone, and even though I don't even know their relationship, maybe they're friends, maybe they're, they're old friends, maybe it's her cousin, I don't even know. But because I'm seeing it, I am making all these assumptions and because of those assumptions, now I'm terrified. This is all happening like, you know, in less than uh, 0.1 second, right? I'm terrified that she's gonna leave me and my typical way of dealing with this, perhaps subconsciously, is to get angry. And then once I'm angry, my typical way of responding to this, maybe I learned this or just fell into this habit over time, is that I will become controlling and maybe even abusive. I will protest. I will go to 
my attachment figure and I will say, this is unacceptable. You cannot do this. Okay. So that's typically the flow chart. And the way that people tend to talk about this is that, well, he's a narcissist and he is manipulative and abusive. And sure, depending on what you mean by those things. But in my experience, take it from me, I have worked with court ordered perpetrators of intimate partner violence, people who have been charged because to rise to that level, you have to have a typically a pretty robust pattern and extreme behavior because the police can charge individuals with charges related to domestic violence that don't involve violence of any kind, but it's harder for that to happen anyway. So there are so many people that are not that sort, you know, they don't rise to that level. I was treating people that rose to that level. And nearly every time, if not every time, what I would find is that there was a lot of, a lot of evidence pointing in the direction of a conceptualization that I mentioned earlier. Uh, instead of they woke up in the morning and said, I want to be a jerk face to everybody. And I want to alienate my partner. <laughs> right. Um, so there's that. Now, do those people exist? Yeah. Unfortunately, there are psychopaths, there are sadistic people who don't care about other human beings' feelings. And, you know, they might even wake up in the morning and actually desire to harm people. So there is that. But they're rare. They're extremely rare. Anyway, so we're hearing a jealous moment for, I think, what she's talking about is Jeremy. But to, he was upset about this, y'all. Like, so much so that he left us at the bar and this is before uber and before lyft so we had to call okay so i thought what she was going to say is it was before uber or lyft so he had to walk home but i think what she's saying is he left in his car and left abandoned them they they couldn't get home <laughs> wow and I think it's good that we heard that bit before I recall what we learned from the show, because we saw a very similar scene to this during the bean dip party. All right. So just chiming in here, the rest of this video will be just for members of this channel. If you want to see this full video, then become a member of this channel by clicking the join button below or clicking the link in the description. You'll get access to all my member exclusive videos and take, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.